device, please shut it off or silence it. Thanks. I guess he's got it on. All right, let's begin. Um, good evening. My name is Nina Rosamondo, and as Voter Services Chair of the League of Women Voters of South County, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this League Forum for the Wesley School Council School Committee candidates. Uh, there are seven candidates, uh, one of whom has withdrawn, so tonight there are six candidates for the three open spots on the School Committee. They're here this evening to share their views and positions on issues of importance to the residents of Westerly. A major responsibility for all of us in a democracy is to be educated, civically engaged citizens. Since its founding over 100 years ago, the League's primary mission has been to provide forums and other programs so that voters can be educated about the issues as well as where the candidates stand on those issues when they cast their vote. The views expressed tonight are those of the candidates, not of the League of Women Voters, and the sponsorship of this forum is not an endorsement by the League of any candidate. The League is nonpartisan and does not endorse candidates or political parties. Following the closure of the schools for over a year during the pandemic, there has been considerable controversy in Westerly and many other communities across our country about what should be taught in our public schools and how it should be taught. It is hoped that tonight's forum will inform voters on where the candidates who are running here in Westerly stand on those issues. We request of the audience that you hold your applause until after the last closing statement. Please also refrain from talking or shouting out um, anything during this forum. There will be a break of 15 minutes between this forum and the next one. I would now like to welcome our moderator, Mrs. Pat Cole. Pat is a Narragansett resident. Uh, just for your information, uh, the League moderators are never constituents of the candidates up on the dais. So Pat is from Narragansett and she is a League member. She's a Rhode Islander, raised and educated in the Providence Public Schools. Mm -hmm. After receiving a bachelor's degree from Mount Holyoke College, she pursued further education and earned a master's degree of library and media services. Pat raised two children while continuing a career in education in Virginia, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New Jersey. She and her husband summered in Narragansett for many years, and they retired here full-time in 2014. Since then, Pat has engaged in a wide variety of local and statewide civic and charitable volunteer activities, some of which include Macaulay House, Ollie at URI, the General Federation of Women's Clubs in South County, and the Clouds Hill Museum. Pat is an activist. She is truly an example of what it means not only to be civically engaged in a democracy, but also to encourage and lead others to use their voice. So Pat, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, so good evening. My name is Pat Cole. Before we begin, I'd like to describe the format for this evening's forum. Candidates have drawn lots to determine seating order prior to the start of the forum. There are six candidates tonight, running for three open seats on the Westerly School Committee. Mr. Felix Martinez has withdrawn from the race, although his name remains on the ballot. In order to ask as many questions as possible, there will be no opening statement, only a closing statement of one minute. Questions were submitted by Westerly residents via an anonymous questionnaire and vetted by the Voter Services Committee of the League of Women Voters, South County. No questions will be taken from the public tonight. All candidates will be asked each question and will have one minute to answer. A candidate may choose to pass on answering any question. The first question will be addressed to candidate number one, with each candidate following from left to right. 
The second question will be addressed first to candidate number two, and so on, until each candidate has had an opportunity to respond first. You will be giving two wild cards, which you may use to add 30 seconds to your response to a question, or to comment on another candidate's response at any time after each candidate has answered the first question, so after that first round. Uh, you may only use each red uh, card once, so you only have two times to do that. Uh, there are two timers who will give you a 30 second and a 15 second warning, followed by a stop card. You may complete your sentence, but will be interrupted by the moderator if you continue. There will also be a round of yes, no questions for all candidates. You may choose to pass, but not elaborate on the question. The first question will begin with candidate number six, followed by five through one. The second question will be addressed to candidate number five, and so on. The forum will end with the one minute closing beginning with candidate number one and going left to right. Please also mute your mics until it is your turn to speak, and then mute when you have completed your answer. Be sure to place your face close to the mic so that people in the back of the chamber and online can hear you. And so let's begin by just please stating your name, starting with um, the candidate on the left. Timothy Killam. Thank you. Leslie Dunn. Thank you. Angela Gothels. Lori Wycall. Seth Logan. Michael Ober. Thank you. Okay, so the first question goes to Mr. Killam, and it is, please name several policies you think the school committee should put in place to improve the ranking of the Westerly school system as a whole and at each level. Wow, starting off with a tough one here. <laughs> um, policies in place, well, I mean, that's something that the, you know, the committee chooses, does as a whole. Um, I think we need to look at uh, many different things right now uh, you know the focus being I hear a lot about test scores and improving test scores um, I think we need to take you know take a little step back regarding that um, people need to remember that using COVID is not an excuse but it's a reality that the last two years of data is really hard to to process mm -hmm. and kids not being in the building for years was tough um, so I guess we really need to look at I would like to put a policy back in place, at least start to where we do more hands-on learning and less with the computers again, and kind of get back to that type of style of teaching. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Dunn. Thank you for the question. Um, so um, as uh, Mr. Killam just said, one of the things that is a reality for us is there was um, a considerable learning loss. And in general, we know even with summers and you know breaks in school, there's always opportunities where um, we might miss out on some things and need to reevaluate you know, what it looks like moving forward. Uh, so I do think as far as it goes when we're reviewing policies within our school, we definitely need to take a look at um, what does it look like for this kind of new normal that we're living through right now? Um, and how can we best address and reallocate our resources to make sure you know, we're meeting students where they are, bringing those students up, and making sure that the students who um, are performing, that we're also continuing to push them forward. Um, and I think we also have to be really mindful of um, there's going to be mixed learning opportunities. So, you know, whether it's uh, in classroom um, opportunities, if it's things that we're doing online, and just some of those extracurricular supports that we can offer to students to make sure um, that we're going to bring them up and we're going to continue to increase our numbers, increase our test scores, and increase the enrollment that's in our schools. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Miss, now please tell me how you pronounce your last name. It's Gothals. Gothals. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Gothals. Thank you for the question. Um, I would say, as uh, my fellow candidates have already stated, I think that beginning where we are is important and acknowledging that that doesn't look like anything that we've ever seen before. 
I think that numbers tell a part of the story, but not the whole story. And so what I would advocate for is asking ourselves how we can lay a groundwork for increased uh, awareness of the difficulties that we've all faced and acknowledging those. And I think a huge part of that is mental health awareness and creative outlets. I've been thinking a lot about the connection between mental health and the arts. I'm an actor, I'm an artist, I'm a creative, and I think there's a huge connection between those two. So what I would advocate for at the elementary level is play, play, play all day. <laughs> Lots of opportunities to play and imagine and explore and move their bodies. At the middle school level, I would say creative writing or uh, other opportunities to express themselves. And similarly, at the high school, I would advocate for increasing and strengthening arts programs. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Moikal. Hi, thank you. Um, I think the first thing that I would like to implement would be for school safety and security, making sure that we have a, a student resource officer in every building. There cur currently, there's only one in the high school and the middle school, and I think that's really important for us as a community to make sure that the students are safe in their environment. Um, I think another policy that I would like to see would be either enforcing the disciplinary policies a little bit more strictly or implementing policies that will hold children more accountable because we have a big problem with bullying and uh, violence in the schools, vaping, all kinds of things that are just detracting from the kids learning in school and I think a little bit more uh, strict disciplinary policies will help that. Thank you. Mr. Logan. Sorry. Um, I believe we need to set and maintain uh, high expectations, first of all. As she said, um, there's a lot of disciplinary issues, especially in our middle schools. Um, our procedures and policies need to be a little bit more clear for the parents, in my opinion, and, and consistently adhered to. Um, I think we should encourage student-to-student -student mediation in regards to these disciplinary issues um, and encourage parental involvement as well on these issues. Um, we definitely need to discourage uh, cell phone use and uh, as well as social media use. Um, it's a big issue right now as well. And as Lori said, we, need, we definitely need security uh, resource officers at all of our facilities. And uh, I'd also like to see those officers maybe integrated into some of the classrooms and, and extracurricular activities. You need to stop now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Ober. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the policies that I would push for is more help for the students. Right now, if a student's having problems, there are um, help available. I'd like to expand that either with after-school programs or maybe set up more tutorings that could be done through the school system with uh, help from volunteers. So I would like to um, do that kind of policy. Also, I'd like to have a policy that reviews our mental health, health practices uh, every year to see you know, how successful they were, what didn't work, and also to see if we need more. You know, I'd also like that policy that would also look at how the students uh, improve based on after school things, sports, technology, arts, and I think that would be important to see if we can connect those things to improving their score and scores and also their whole school life. As in terms of a resource. Oh. Thank you. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll go to question number two and I will introduce the person who's going to begin answering the question, but then would you please state your name before you answer your question? Okay, thank you. So this question, we start with Ms. Dunn, and it is, if elected, will you be in the position to vote on the school, but you will be in the position to vote on the school budget. 
What priorities would you support in the budget? Please explain. Thank you for the question. Um, so I've had this come up a lot in conversation about uh, budgets for our schools and of course in an ideal world education would be top of the list and every teacher would have what they need and every student would have what they need. I think some of our biggest areas uh, to make sure we're uh, allocating our funds appropriately is definitely as it's been explained here already um, mental health resources and I think that's both for our students and our teachers. Um, in order for our students to be able to do what they need to do successfully they need to be in an environment where they can express how they're feeling and they know the right adults to go to or the right spaces to go to to have those conversations. And then for our teachers, we all have experienced it. Burnout is real. We wanna make sure that our teachers, again, have those spaces to go to and they're able to talk through those things and get in touch with the right people. Um, so I definitely would say mental health. And then I also think extracurricular activities um, and even homework help, um, our sports programs, any of the clubs and organizations that we can bring into the school and rely heavily on community partnerships to make that happen and make sure we allocate funds in those places. Thank you. Thank you, Angela Gothels. I am not great at budgeting in my life, so forgive me. <laughs> I'm going to attempt to answer this question. Um, I believe, I agree with what uh, Leslie just said, and I would add that to answer this question, I would want to talk to the teachers and say, what do you need? What do you need to teach? What do you need to thrive? Um, I think that our uh, facilities need help, and that's why I'm hoping that everyone votes yes on question number four, the school bond referendum. I think we need to begin there and we need to look at our facilities and make sure that they're supporting our incredible teachers and their work. That said, I also agree that uh, school safety is a high priority and I think something that came up last week with an incident at Springbrook School is that we need to look at uh, our outdoor spaces as well. So I would say as far as budgeting, I would want to bring as many community members into the conversation as possible and see what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just remind you to talk close to the microphone so everyone can hear. So yes. Thank you. Uh, Lori Wycall. Uh, as I mentioned in my previous answer, I think uh, in looking at the budget, we need to budget for, student, for the student resource officers. That's definitely going to be a big expenditure if that's to go through. I also think that um, looking at the uh, staffing shortages that we have mm -hmm. with bus drivers, paraprofessionals, and mental health professionals, the budget needs to be allocated appropriately to, uh, to find those people, bring those people into our district to be able to relieve the sh shortages that we have. Um, I also, for the budget, think that we need to look at the um, annually, the keep maintenance of the buildings that needs to be kept up a little bit better, I think, especially if we go through with the um, improvements on the schools, question four, which I hope also, as Angela stated, uh, is voted yes. Uh, we're going to need to allocate some funds over year over year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Seth Logan. Um, first of all, um, I would say we need to invest in technology, upgrade our classrooms, um, certainly clean up our buildings, um, add to the spaces a little bit, make them a little bit more positive of a space for our teachers to be in and, and our students to be in. So um, obviously mental health is a big issue for me as well. Um, I think we should invest obviously in proper resources and training and people that are qualified to deal with those issues instead of having our teachers be overburdened with all that extra. Um, Certainly security, again, and on technology, maybe, you know, add cameras that we can access as parents on the website, maybe if we had to sign in or whatever it may be. I know we just had an issue at one of the schools this past week or so, two weeks ago, and it'd be nice to know what's going on, you know? You don't know if there's a major issue there or whatever, and I think that can be easy to easily be solved, you know, through video and... Okay, 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Ober. Yes, my budget priorities would be to keep the class sizes reasonably so that the teachers can teach, the students can learn. Uh, large classrooms you know, work against that. I would also be prioritizing technology in the use in the classroom for the students, the teachers, and at home. Also part of technology would be in our transportation where we you know, this year just purchased two electric buses that will make it better for our students, a better environment for them as well. Uh, yes, maintenance of the school is important. Uh, I've been involved in that for years. Uh, right now we're going forward with a school bond referendum because the buildings have become too old and we can't just maintain them, but th that would be a high priority. So I, I think those things would be um, my top priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Timothy Killam. Uh, I think everybody up here has kind of hit the hot points, but um, I, I do also support a school resource officer in all the buildings. I think we do have the opportunity, being a beach community and working with the Westerly Police Department, where we probably could share, you know, the responsibility and costs by, um, you know, maybe sharing an officer that has beach duties in the summer as a way to reduce our budget deficit. Um, I also believe, you know, possibly having a workshop where we do have a, a workshop with the parents and the teachers learning what, what they really need and hearing from them um, collaboratively. Um, we're lucky that we have a new director of pupil personnel in the district who is actually working very hard and has been very successful at filling some of these mental health positions that were open um, with some excellent candidates. So we are actually in very good shape um, in that area. It's, it's continuing to improve daily. So we're very fortunate with that. Um, Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now, question number three will go to Ms. Goethals first. And here it is. Outline specifically how you think parents should or should not influence school curriculum. Thank you for the question. I had a mom friend when my oldest daughter was born. And when I expressed my concern, as all parents have, when your babies start to grow and they start to inhabit spaces where you are not, I said, oh my gosh, how do I know that she's going to be okay? How do I know that the people around her are going to be aligned with my vision for what I want for her? And this very wise mama said to me, your voice is the loudest voice in her head. You are the one who tucks her in at night. You are the one who sits down with her at the dinner table and says, honey, how is school? What are you learning? Let's talk about it. So as far as parental involvement with our schools, I really want to let our teachers teach, and I want to have the conversations in my own home with my own kids. Thanks. Lori Wycall. Uh, I feel very strongly that parental rights are important in the school. I believe that parents have the right to be able to take a look um, at the curriculum that's being offered. Obviously, the uh, curriculum leaders and the teachers are the professionals that will select the curriculum that's offered through RIDE. Uh, but I, I do believe that parents have the right to be able to access that. I, I think our website needs to be revised a little bit, revamped to make it a little bit more user friendly so that parents can get the information they need uh, much easier. When you go on the system right now, it's really hard to find anything that you're looking for and it ends up uh, frustrating, I think frustrating a lot of parents and really causing undue uh, questions and, and bothering other people that don't need to be bothered by that. So I, I thank you. Okay. Seth Logan. I agree. Lori, what just, Lori just said that that's a huge issue. Um, the website, even, even if you're an involved parent, the website, you try and find this information, the training, teacher training, and you, it's so difficult to even access any of this. Our curriculum listed online shows limited information. We should have previews to all our materials that are children are subjected to. We should have access to all teacher training materials. Um, parents should direct the moral upbringing of their child. Uh, that's, I feel strongly on that, actually. 
Um, we should have e easy access to all their, s their school records and medical information. We should have one source for our emails. We get f emails from 10 different locations, very easy to miss. Um, and everything, these surveys and whatnot, everything should go back to the old style of, of opt out. I mean, excuse me, opt in mm. if you want to. Instead, right now, it's the exact opposite. Time's up. So, thank you. Michael Ober. Uh, yes, in, curriculum is developed by the teachers, the administration, following uh, ride rules and guidelines and policies. Also, it's developed using information based on how different programs are working in the system. Parents should have a, a say in the curriculum, but their, their say should be on the committees that are offered, the subcommittees like social emotional uh, committees, the uh, policy committees that are developed, the PTOs and things like that. And also they should be comfortable with talking about it with their teacher as well. But when we're shaping curriculum, it's, it's based on the needs of the student using data, using information, using policy. And we can keep changing depending on a group of parents wanting this, a group of parents wanting that. Their influence would be in communication with their teacher, communication with the different subcommittees, and with the school committee. Uh, you know, as long as we keep those communications and listen to what they say, we can help shape future curriculum decisions and also see how it's improving the school system. Thank you. Thank you. Timothy Killam. I agree with a lot of what's been said tonight. Um, I think I would like to see it more as a team approach with the curriculum. Um, you know, your students and the parents, you are a team for your, for your child. And I can tell you that, you know, I have a kindergarten student this year and the new kindergarten curriculum I think is pretty extreme. I mean, some of the stuff even my son comes home and says, I'm like, wow, where did that come from? Um, but I also, in just collaborating with his teachers, know that um, it's a stress on the staff because it's just, some of the expectations in the current curriculum are, are really difficult. So I think we really need to review it together as a team. And again, it's, it's a team approach. You're never going to get everybody to agree on the, the same thing. It's just not a reality, let's face it. But I think if we could work together with subcommittees and um, you know, get everybody involved, I think we could come up with something that works for everyone. Leslie Dunn. Um, so when it comes to curriculum, as many people have stated here, it really is, um, it's gonna be a group effort. So, you know, the educators, of course, they're following right standards and choosing from the offered curriculums and then choosing the one that best fits the needs of our students in this community. Um, so then the follow-up piece to that is, you know, what does it look like for students to go home or to be with their friends and be outside of the school, what are those conversations going to be like? So I think there's a really good space to say, this is a curriculum that's been chosen, here are the things that are gonna be outlined through the year, and have open dialogue where parents can come in and students can come in with them and say, you know, I have a question about how this topic is going to be covered, or you know, I'd love to know more about this um, project that's going on and how it's going to affect my student. Um, me personally, I know growing up, there were times where certain books were offered and my mom would read the books as well, and then we'd have a conversation about at home about those different things. So I think there can be structured things happening within our schools to continue the conversation about the curriculum and address those concerns because it is real to our community and if somebody is affected, we wanna have that conversation. Thank you. I may remind you that you have those red cards if you want to expand on a, a question or if you would like to respond to a question. Okay. Um, all right, question number four for Ms. Weichel. It is, what do you think are the most important components of the new high school graduation requirements and why? I honestly don't know a lot about the new requirements. I know that's something that is being talked about at a state level. I think it's actually on the um, school committee agenda for the next meeting to review them again. And I, I apologize, I'm not up to, up to beat on really having followed those at all. So thank you. Okay. As Lori said, um, we attend, actually, we've almost attended every meeting over the past year, at least I have. She has almost as well, probably a little bit beyond that. And I don't think we've really gotten to that. Again, things are very difficult um, 
to look into with this system. It takes a lot of time, each, each issue. So obviously we'll be waiting for that to come up in, in the meeting. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Michael Ober, you know what, what I think is good about the uh, the requirements is the one thing I like that stands out. And I think we should keep is where the student has to do a presentation at the end of the year. It makes them look at everything, a particular subject that they're interested in, and it puts it together in writing and presentation. You know, I had two children go through the school system. I remember my uh, older son doing something on sleep deprivation. And so he, he was his test subject. So I, it gave him kind of like a hands-on and it also allowed us to see what he was doing and how he was coping with it. And it was, it was interesting. So I, I, mean, I think that's a part of it that is really good. I think we should keep. And I mean, that's, I, I think, one of the more important things that when we're talking about parental involvement, that you can get involved in that. Thank you. Timothy Killam. Um, I, I do have a 2022 Westerly High School graduate, so I've been involved with it with him. Um, like Mr. Ober said, it, it's the hands-on with the, the senior projects and the presentations that's really an incredible opportunity for you, know, you as a family to build together. So I, I actually really like it. I like the community service requirements. It gets them out into the community and into different you know, venues. It's nice that you know, they can split it up over their four years and choose to you know, maybe 10 hours you know, down at the beach, 10 hours working at the library. It, it really does allow uh, the students to get involved more. I mean, my son is now entering a trade school and I think really the requirements that he had at his final year helped him really be successful so far. So I really like it. Leslie Dunn. Um, so again, I think the, uh, as you look at the high school graduation requirements, it does put us in a good space. We have a beautiful community that um, we really rally around each other. Um, so tapping into our community partners in this area is a really strong way to help our students with community service, with senior projects, to help them build those skills to make those decisions for their next steps in life. Um, I also think something many of us are realizing, um, college is no longer just the number one answer for everybody, and it looks different for everybody what post-graduation is going to look like. So our graduation requirements really need to reflect the diverse backgrounds and the diverse futures all these students are going to have. So creating those opportunities, whether it's being out in the community, those individualized projects, the different avenues they can take within the school, the um, career tech programs, all of those pieces, that's really going to help them make those decisions. So when they step out of those doors, when they graduate, they have a really good foundation for what they want to do next. Thank you. Angela Gothels, so I totally cheated and I wasn't aware of what the high school graduation requirement was and then my fellow candidates sort of <laughs> with their answers clued me in. Um, I would echo what everyone said about engaging our high school graduates in the community. This is a beautiful, strong, supportive community and I think that as we enter high school, the dialogue becomes who we want to be in the world, and we're starting to really make those choices uh, for ourselves during that time. I would expand upon that a little bit and say where my mind goes instantly is uh, spaces like the Playwell Neighborhood Studio or Rhode Island Philharmonic Music School at the United. These are powerful, powerful resources, and I would love to see those take off in the future. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right, this question goes to Mr. Logan. How do you think the history of slavery and racism from our nation's founding to the present should be taught in the Westerly schools? Please be specific about that. How should it be taught? Uh, in, in honesty, obviously, fully, should tell the full, full story, always in history and and everything else, both sides of the story. Um, I don't know if you're directing that more towards what we have going on with the equity stuff and all that, but um, to me, I've, I've looked, again, I've done a lot of research on this system and um, 
the equity thing doesn't really, people make the mistake of thinking that it, that it teaches history. Um, and I've looked through the materials. I've, I've read a lot of these books in this curriculum and I, I have yet to see uh, one solitary piece of, of history. So, thank you. Uh, Michael Ober. Yeah, uh, history should be taught. It should be taught honestly. Uh, I, I think when I went to school, I got a good grounding in history, but that's what it was. It was a grounding. I think when we take history and make it more personal, when we make it more, it, to, these were real people. These weren't just dates and times. These were people, and you use the, their actual stories uh, to uh, teach the teach the kids you know, how life was, you know, not just simple, you know, this happened such and such a day, this was good, this was bad, but people who lived in that time, they left letters, they left articles, they told us what it was like, and I think history should be taught through that lens of not just uh, learning the book, but bringing it alive for people, making it seem like, yes, I can see why they did that, I can see why they shouldn't have done that, and I can identify with them and learn from that. I think it should be open and honest, and I think there should be plenty of room for dialogue, and we shouldn't be afraid of upsetting people, because in the end, truth, the truth will only help us. You know? And I, I think sometimes we, we look at history as a win-lose. It's not. It's, we're learning about why we're here, why Westerly uh, and the rest of the country is the way it is. And once we can figure that out, we can take the good and the bad from that and, and learn from it. Thank you. Timothy Killam. Um, I, I, I agree with Mr. Ober. I mean, I don't think we should be making a change. I think history needs to be taught. I mean, we, we can't be afraid to teach what has happened. I don't think we should be telling our teachers to change that. I mean, that's just, that's not our job. You know, it's the teacher's job to teach what is reality and, you know, not everybody's going to love everything, but I mean, everybody needs to be subjected to what has happened in the past. And I don't believe that, you know, making, you know, a demand that we have to remove certain things is okay. I just, I don't agree with that. I mean, we can't be afraid that, you know, there's good, bad, and evil in this entire world and country, and it's, it is reality, and that's, kids need to know reality, because otherwise you're setting them up for, you know, a, a failure. You know, we can't be fake. We have to be real. Leslie Dunn, uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I remember a quote, and I can't remember the person who uh, said this quote, so I apologize for that. But um, history is what you need to know. Nostalgia is what you would like to remember. So when we're talking about history and we're talking about slavery and racism, um, slavery is very real. We know it happened. It's been documented. And every day there's more and more coming out. And um, history for a long time has been taught from a very particular perspective. And as uh, Mike Ober said, you know, these are real people with real stories, real conversations, families, um, and a history. And there's so much value to looking at it through a lens of this actually happened to someone. They weren't just, they're not just a part of this story that people get to share from what makes them feel comfortable when we talk about um, having conversations about race, it's something we're, we're looking at every single day. It's out there, we see it um, just, I can personally say I see it in day-to-day -day experiences and in um, moments that I've personally had. You know, to be in 2022 and to still be having conversations about why certain language is inappropriate, to still have people you know, appropriating cultures. Oh, I thought I had. You had 15 seconds, and oh, I think that's okay. passed. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Angela Gothals, it's a really complicated and nuanced question. Obviously, uh, our history needs to be taught, and it needs to be taught fully. What I would add to what my fellow candidates have said is let's take our cues from our kids. I think once the information is given, that is the moment when the conversation begins. And that is the moment when you see what these kids know, what they've experienced themselves, and what they think about it all. 
I really do believe that they are our best teachers in terms of teaching these uh, really complicated and big things. And I think it's, there's not a lot of structure there, but it needs to be open and it needs to be dictated by the kids, I think. Thank you. Lori Wykall, I think that our, the way history has been taught has been truthful. I think uh, what I learned in history, I'm 52, so you know, a lot of years ago in middle school and high school learning history, I don't believe that what history, ha what happened in history has changed. I don't think we need to adjust what lens we're looking at history th through. I believe I learned about slavery and racism, and I think our country has made giant leaps over the last 30, 40 years. And I think by changing the view of how we look at history um, is only detr detrimental to our society. Thank you. Yes. I just want to say, I mean, teach culture, embrace culture, that's, that's how you change things. Um, appreciate culture. History's not always pretty, um, but there's mistakes made, but we grow and become better by learning from those mistakes, not by erasing those mistakes. Thank you. Yes. I uh, wanted to respectfully disagree with you, Lori. I think that history is not static, actually. And I think that our understanding of history changes every day, basically. And I would argue that the lens through which we view our history as humans changes based on what's happening in our current times. Thank you. So now, Mr. Ober gets this next question. If elected, what specifically would you do to increase civility and decrease divisiveness between school committee members and members of the public? Well, as of right now, I think we are doing OK with that. Uh, sometimes the issues people get upset about but what you do is you tr treat each other with respect. You don't get mad at each other over these issues. You don't hold grudges. I think what I would do is personally just remind people that we we're, we're all want the same thing. We want, want the best for our children. We may just have different ways of getting there. And also, to, when I have an opinion, when I have something, I say why. I just don't say you're wrong. I say why I think you're wrong and why I think I'm right. And it's a give and take. And you know, as long as you are respectful to them, they're almost always going to be respectful to you. I mean, I've seen times in the chamber where it would start to get heated, and just by someone changing the tone of their response, it made that other person change their tone, and they probably didn't even realize it. So, I mean, that's what I would do. It's, it starts with the individual, but I think as a group we can uh, just behave ourselves. Thank you. Timothy Killam. Um, I, I would want to be willing to collaborate. I mean, I, I've sat up here before, and when I, I implore any person to come to the podium, because speaking to your elected officials is something you should be doing, and the elected officials should be listening, um, treating everybody with respect. But, you know, I will tell you from experience sitting here that you can't always respond to to somebody coming up to the podium because really what you should be doing is taking your notes, going back, researching it, and then you know maybe either speaking at the next meeting about it, responding in an email, talking, I mean, making it your response public. But you know, I mean, a lot of times it's, it's about collaboration and learning together and you have to be willing to do that um, because you know, a school committee member represents everybody, not just the parents, they represent everybody in the community. Leslie Dunn. Um, so again, we're 
this we'd be serving as um, school committee members, and I think this is where we have to take a beat from the schools. If uh, we were to walk into a classroom and see, you know, teachers and students very heated going back and forth with each other, and you know, people. Uh, causing a scene, we'd be probably disappointed and questioning like what the management in that room looks like and you know the students' feelings and the teachers' feelings. So I think um, both for the people sitting up here and anybody who comes to the podium, there should be a level of respect of the way that we would expect students to carry themselves, of being respectful of each other, being receptive to hearing other people's opinions, and carrying yourself to be a role model in this community that if you're going to come into this space that it happens on both sides. And of course people are human and have emotions but giving space and grace when appropriate, but also being able to have that redirection to say, if we're gonna have this conversation and we're gonna open the doors to this, we're going to be in a safe space where we can mutually have this conversation. Thank you. Angela Gothals. I would say, uh, first of all, that there's nothing that makes parents more frightened than fear about their kids. So I understand the emotion. I understand that it gets very heightened. I think on the school committee, we have to prepare ourselves for that because we're parents and we love our kids. And if there's an issue, we're going to get emotional about it. Uh, that being said, I think our job as school committee members is to find the source of the fear and vet that source and then put the conversation to bed. Thank you. Lori Wycall, I would like to specifically make a change to the way the agenda is set up. I think as a parent coming in, um, some of the frustration before the meeting even starts is not knowing exactly when the meeting's gonna start. And it's pretty basic, but when I'm thinking about coming to a meeting um, and it starts at five, is there an executive session? Is there not an executive session? I think a little bit more kind of transparency, I guess, where some other towns say, have their meeting start at five and they go immediately into executive session, but then the public meeting starts at six. So you kind of know when to go and when, what to expect. I also think that, um, in, in terms of taking ideas from the people that come to the podium, we have to listen to those people. So when people come and express concerns and have ideas that they want the school committee to hear, even though at that time we can't, we won't be able to um, have a discussion with them, I do believe that we should, as a committee, uh, discuss specific questions that came to the podium and then decide if they need to be put on the agenda rather than just letting these questions kind of float out there. I think that causes a lot of frustration for parents when they get up the nerve to come here and speak and feel like you never get any answers. Thank you. As Lori said, um, I've been over there on the other side. Um, some people may know we found some inappropriate materials. Um, it took us eight, ten months to get a change to a policy when, when in my opinion, um, that should have been done almost instantly, seeing we're a lacking policy. Um, people need to be treated with respect all the time. Um, we definitely need transparency and accountability. That's something that's very frustrating to parents, I know. And again, <clears throat> establish consistent, strong leadership that's fair, again, treats everyone with respect, maintain those expectations. Um, again, the policy issue needs to be clearly defined and whatnot, but um, yeah, thank you. So the next question goes to Mr. Killam. Um, it is, the number of Westerly students attending schools outside the district is significant. What policies or changes do you think are needed to both stop the flow out and increase students from other districts choosing to attend a Westerly school? Um, I, I do believe that you know growing our CTE and arts programming will absolutely help retain students from going to districts like Cheriho because we will have those programs available. Um, currently, the program has been expanding, and. Um, 
that there will help us retain students and I do believe actually help us bring students in from other districts because we will be the place to go. Um, we had the special ed audit a couple of years ago now and uh, the new director has been implementing a lot of the changes there. So with bringing in more services, we can keep the students in the special ed, with the special ed needs here in district and again, be the place to go and have students from other districts need to come here because Westerly does have all those supportive services. So I think we really do need to be looking more at the high school level and growing, uh, you know, again, the pathways there. Um, and that will definitely increase our student enrollment. Can you repeat the question? Do you want it? Just, can you just repeat the question? I'll repeat the question. Yeah, okay, the question is, the number of Westerly students attending schools outside the district is significant. What policies or changes do you think are needed to both stop the flow out and increase students from other districts choosing to attend a Westerly school? Okay. Thank you. All right. Leslie Dunn. Um, so first, it, it, creating um, programs that make us competitive with other districts. So whether that's our CTE programs, our uh, arts programs, even just our core classes that we're offering, making sure that we have the appropriate classes listed so students are you know, set up to, again, if they're choosing to go to trade school after, choosing to go right out into work, or they're choosing to go to a college, what does that um, course load look like for them to be able to do those things that would make a family make the decision to put their child into the district and then continue with this district? Um, and I think uh, we've seen the high school make incredible changes to the CTE program that's really helped us bring back some of those students who traditionally we've seen in years past, they have left our district. Um, I think also when it looks like bringing in new students, this is uh, another time where we need to look to the town um, and work really closely with town council and with um, different community partners to identify ways that we can increase the number of people moving into our community with families and with school-aged children. Um, and you know, a big piece of that is affordability and having places for people to go so they can continue to live in this community and choose the schools here in this community and they don't make the choice to live 20 minutes or 15 minutes outside of our community. Thank you. Okay. Angela Gothels. I would humbly offer the idea of collaborating with these other districts or at least asking families, hey, what is it about Cheriho that's appealing to you? Uh, why did you choose to send your kid there as opposed to staying here? Uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from the families in this town and uh, I think that could be an amazing resource for our district. In addition, I totally agree, uh, Tim, you've used this word a lot tonight, uh, collaborative, and I feel, and Leslie too, community. I think these are amazing resources for us as far as figuring out how we can make Westerly schools stand out. What do we need to offer that gets people excited about sending their kids here? Uh, what's different? Um, and I guess that's probably a conversation for our families and our school committee uh, moving forward. Thank you. Lori Wycall, I think that there should be a policy in place so that so when uh, families are leaving the district, there should almost be like an exit interview process. Um, every school committee meeting, you, we see the homeschool approvals, and a lot of them are new. I think we had about 60 new homeschools during the school year last year on top of the 100 renewals. So we have a lot of people that are just deciding not to stay in the Westerly schools and we need to ask those families why and then determine as a district what we can do to um, alleviate those issues. Um, the CTE program, I mean, let's be real, we're trying to do what Cheriho's done so well. So I think the CTO, ET, CTE program is doing a really good job and I think they're uh, retaining a lot of kids that maybe three or four years ago may have gone to Cheriho. Thank you. Um, again, not to hit the same chords, but um, we definitely need to address our, our disciplinary issues here. Um, that's, that's something that every parent I talk to ha has a problem with. Um, we need to, again, not to 
hit the same points, but upgrade our facilities, um, add technology to our classrooms, um, give parents a reason to want to stay here. You know, um, we need to, as they said, add to our CTE program. I've heard at one of the meetings uh, a good idea was to do some uh, aerospace type type programs. Um, uh, we need to do, as I said before, a better job engaging parents and making them feel welcomed, um, easier access, and, and again, provide a safe environment for, for our teachers and, and for our students. Okay. Uh, Michael Ober. Uh, yeah, you know, th this is something we've thought about a lot. You know, that's why they created the CTE program to help uh, keep students in here, but also special education. What are we offering people? And also the other night they were talking about creating a, um, uh, uh, a, uh, um, a cooperation with the hockey to get for to for certain people who want to do hockey in Westerly. They can go to or someplace else and do it, and that. You know, very little money, and they were able to do it. But I think one of the big things is that people have to believe that we believe in our school system, that we're going to invest in it. You know, we're on our third bond referendum for the elementary schools. You know, people would look at that and say, why can't you pass a uh, invest in your schools? And really, I think it's more of there were too, too many different ideas of how to do it, and they couldn't agree. But now we're at our third and final bond referendum, and this is where we have a chance to show that we are interested in our schools. We, we're going to invest in it. We're going to invest in it. We're going to make it better for the elementary kids. We're going to um, provide better services, better classroom space. We're going to be able to use the space better, and I think that's going to help us keep, keep the students in for, you know, from the elementary on to the high school. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Gothels, are the two of you? <laughs> Ms. Gothels. Hi. I just wanted to uh, sort of piggyback on what you said, Mike. I agree with it. And I would also uh, sort of echo, I think there's a theme tonight of uh, the issues before the, the school committee. And I would say, making the school committee a, a, a viable uh, part of our larger community, strengthening the bond with town council, and really making this space uh, seem accessible and welcoming and yeah. inviting people in. Thanks. Mr. Kelly. All right, kind of piggybacking over what Mr. Ober said, but I mean, we need to get this bond passed. That's the bottom line. I mean, the elementary schools need to get taken care of because people are leaving because of the condition of them. I mean, we are on our third try here. Let's get this done. That is, that's my plug for it. It's time to vote for number four. Okay. Okay. Next question, Ms. Dunn will start. It is, many westerly citizens think the school budget needs to be cut to reflect the decrease in the number of students. Please discuss the specific costs or areas you would like to cut. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I think what really has to happen with the budget is uh, really looking at line items and really going through, and again, I think you have to look at how do we reallocate and how do we make checks and balances to see where our funding is going to make those decisions. I think uh, oftentimes we know what gets on the chopping block when it comes time to talk about budgets. It's things like our music programs, our art programs, you know, tutoring. It's, you know, those things that people deem extra services. So um, I wouldn't feel comfortable making a decision right now, having not seen the budget in that sense, to say, you know, cut here and take this away. It really comes down to looking at what items there are and where we can readjust, move funds around, um, and then taking a look to say what things do we need to remove from the budget and make a goal for us to get back into our budget. Because I think if we take it away, we need to figure out what's the alternative option and then how do we bring those things back in. Thank you. Okay. Again, as Leslie said, not having seen the actual budget, it's challenging to answer. My instinct tells me, however, going back to the first question of the night, that thanks to COVID, I really believe that we start from 
a blank slate almost rather than looking at our budget and trying to cut and 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 you know mold it into something i almost believe that getting rid of it entirely and building it back up uh, through looking at what we need and then looking at how we can afford it. I would approach it that way. Thank you. Lori Wykall. I don't think that the budget needs to be cut. I think it's been level funded for several years in a row now, I believe. And I don't think that we should be making cuts to the budget. I think um, having looked at the budget, there are um, little things. There are open positions in staff, staffing positions that are open, but the, they still include that salary in the budget. So I think the budget just needs to really be looked at with a fine-tooth comb and figure out how better to allocate some of the funds, how to uh, eliminate having the excess. I think last year there was over a million dollars in excess, and I think it had to do because of some of these open positions that sat open. Um, I do also believe that our district is very top heavy and we could look at some of the positions um, and see where some of those funds might be better allocated for the students. Thank you. As Laurie said, it's tough. I mean, we've, I've looked through the budget a couple times, but until, until you're seated up here and you can actually digest everything, it's, it's very difficult to, to place judgment. I would definitely preserve our arts, music, and trades programs. I know that much. As Lori said, um, kind of, um, I know our administration is um, a huge number on that budget. Um, one other place I think there's some interest there is like bringing our special needs kids back to this district. Um, I know that costs us a considerable amount of money, so thank you. Michael Ober. No, I, I wouldn't cut our budget. I, I understand people's concerns, the per pupil costs, but you know, per pupil costs only tell you part of the picture. And yes, we've had uh, surpluses, but that was based on positions that we could not fill, not that we didn't need, but like everyone else, we're having some sort of staffing issues because there are more jobs than there are people, and it's more education you need, the harder it is to find people. Right now, Wesley's doing okay. In the future, it, that problem's gonna grow. I think maybe we can reallocate our funds better. Uh, you, every year we go through the budget to see what we, was working, what we can do differently. But you know, it, I, I've heard the thing about the administration. I remember the first time I was on the school committee, we had no assistant superintendent and we didn't have three principals and they were still telling us how we were top heavy. So, you know, you always look for your administrations. You always look to see what's working, what's not. But if you go and just cut your budget just in the terms of how much you're spending right now, you're going to create problems in the future. Timothy Killam. Again, kind of piggybacking. Uh, but, you know, I've been through a couple of budget seasons uh, being on the school committee, and it's intense. I mean, there's a lot involved. So, I mean, I think... To hear people say it just needs to be cut, it, it's not reality. Um, and uh, to Ms. Wyckoff's point, I mean, it, the school budget has been level funded the last couple of years. That that is a fact. Um, I hear people, you know, talking about the pu per pupil expense, and it, the number's high. I mean, Westerly is high. There's there's no doubt about it. But you've got to understand that that's an average, and it's an average of our, our students. You remember that we have special needs students; that their number is much higher than maybe you know the student sitting next to them. So you've got to be careful when you're looking at that number to say, "Oh, just Westerly spending too much," because that that's not always the case. Um, and so you know, a way to decrease that number is again we could bring in students and keep students here. Stop paying to send students to other districts. Um, that that's a big part of it. And again, going to our special needs because our new director is really working on that staffing issue, we are retaining those students now and not uh, not having them go out of district. Okay. Okay, this question goes to Ms. Goethals. Uh, given the reports of students' increased mental health needs as a result of the pandemic, how do you recommend the school system cope with the problem? Thank you for the question, Angela Gothals. As I've said earlier, and the more and more I think about it, the more sense it makes, I believe a big key to our students' mental health is relaxing the structure 
and embracing a more creative moment for them in their day. Uh, I don't know exactly what that looks like. I think it could look different uh, for different students at different uh, grade levels. But I do believe that it's essential that these kids are not looked at as numbers and test scores, but that they are given an opportunity to express themselves creatively. Uh, I think that, again, our community has amazing resources here, and I would love to see a subcommittee devoted strictly to bringing arts groups in to perform Sorry. for their kids. Thank you. Okay. Lori Wycall. Um, I think the way you asked the question was important to note that the uh, increased mental health because of COVID, so this seems to me to be a perfect place to use some of the ESSER, ESSER funds. Uh, we have uh, millions of dollars that were given to us by the state to mitigate uh, fallout from the pandemic, and I think it's a perfect place to use it to hire actual mental health professionals to bring them into the school so that when a student is uh, designated or pinpointed as needing extra help, they should be, um, they should be uh, individualized and that child should be worked with with a professional that's in that position. I don't think this should be um, piggybacked onto the teachers. Um, it's really important, it's a, it's, a, it's a profession that we need those professionals in, in the schools to help these kids. Um, and again, being an, an individual situation for each child that is, is identified as having some extra needs rather than painting an entire classroom or age group um, with a broad, a broad brush stroke and just saying that everybody needs extra help because everybody doesn't need extra help and it will expose children to things that, that you know maybe they're not ready for. They may not be at the same capacity or situation that certain kids that need the extra help where they are. Thank you. Okay. First thing I want to Ms. Gothel said, um, I have to disagree with, I believe our kids, again, not, not to talk about the same points, but they need structure. They w need to achieve. That's, that's how you reinforce positive mental health. Um, obviously, we need to focus on their safety, the comfort, um, working with the community, um, as well as um, again, engage them through technology because our environment's stale right now. Um, that's where I feel like we need the most help, again, through, through technology. And that's where you interject culture in, in arts. Um, again, provide these kids with a bright, clean, positive, healthy environment. I mean, that, that's a start. Um, again, direct these kids that maybe your ADHD are, are more apt to work with their hands towards trades. Thank you. Uh, Michael Ober, can you repeat that question, please? Yes. <clears throat> Given the reports of students' increased mental health needs as a result of the pandemic, how do you recommend the school system cope with the problem? Well, I think we should cope with the problem by, you know, offering more mental health help more help with mental health, offering facilities, working with the town also, because sometimes these issues go beyond what the, the school can offer. So I think we also need to uh, tr offer more training and support to our teachers who have to deal with these things as well. And I, I think by doing those things, we can kind of uh, help the children, help, help the staff work with everything. Uh, I think COVID offered a kind of glimpse into our problems. I don't think it really created them. I think it just exposed them and made them worse. And I think this is an opportunity. We can take that information and use it to address problems that have been there all along. And I think the resources we need, you know, they are being, they, are, they do ha seem to be prioritized now and for the near future. We will have to fight to keep that going because as time goes on, these things are forgotten and go on to the next thing. So. That's what I think. Okay. Thank you. Timothy Killam. Um, you know, COVID did create such learning losses, but, you know, 
kids are sponges. They listen. They hear their teachers. They hear their parents at home. I mean, these discussions of standardized testing and the standardized testing scores. Kids are not standardized. They're individual children. That's what they are. And you know what? I disagree with this this push on technology because that's what we did with COVID. And prior to COVID, you know, we went to this one-to-one -one initiative with the Chromebooks. And I personally hated it. And I still hate it because of this reliance on these things. You know, I will look at my, my oldest son who took the PSATs the traditional way. And then he was forced to take the SATs on a Chromebook or on a computer. And you know what? There was a 300-point difference. Some kids don't operate on a, on a computer. They just don't. And you know what? Some kids don't operate reading, you know, on a screen. They operate by reading a book. I mean, we're, we're forgetting that. And, you know, we're going to this reliance on a comp staring at a screen all day. And, you know, I mean, there's a phrase I, I've, I've seen recently, which is, you know, look at faces and not devices. And I think we need to remember that because we're, we're stressing these kids out with these, you know, with these numbers. That it's not necessary. Kids need to be kids, too, you know? Okay. Yes. Again, when I say technology, I mean, that doesn't necessarily have to mean we're staring at a screen either. That could be interactive games that in involves learning as well. Um, the, a big issue is our, our curriculum and, and the materials provided to our kids as well, because it, it reinforces a, a sick, demented mind and mental illness, um, sex, drugs, anything you can think of, honestly, bulimia, suicide. You cannot promote this stuff and, and expect our children Excuse to have me. a healthy That's mind. It. Your time's Sorry, up. Sorry, thank, thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, to... uh, Leslie Dunn. So again, we've talked a lot tonight about partnerships and collaboration. So I think first we need to identify you know, what resources do our teachers have? What trainings can we offer them to help them better identify when they see a student who they think there may be a struggle with mental health? and then having the right resources in our schools or identifying those in the community that they would be able to send students to. Um, and then also being able to have spaces where parents can come in with the teachers, with administrators. And you know, we have workshops where we talk about mental health, talk about those things that we're looking for, and even just make it so it's okay that students, parents, and teachers know there is somewhere and there are people and there are facilities and the right resources that we can help you get connected to and make it a team effort to have those conversations. Um, so that way our students feel supported. And as we've seen um, with COVID, you know, mental health in a sense, there was a, there was a microscope on it. So now we can take a closer look at it and make sure that we have the right things in place so our teachers can help the students and that way our students feel supported. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, now we're gonna shift to the yes and or no part of our evening. Um, and then after that, each of you will have a, um, a closing statement of one minute. So please, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So you all have that one minute at the end. We wanna make sure you do. Okay, we're going to start with Mr. Ober. Uh, please also state your name before you say yes or no to the question. Okay. So, first question. Yes, no. Will you support the $50 million school design bond issue? Michael Ober, yes. A pass. I need further information. Uh, you can pass. Lori Wycall, yes. Angela Gothels, yes. Leslie Dunn, yes. Timothy Killam, yes. Okay. First uh, answer, yes, no, to Mr. Logan. The town council has capped the expense for the elementary school design at $50 million. Given inflation and building costs for the proposed new State Street School, would you be willing to request that the town council approve an additional bond issue should it be needed to cover the renovations for Springbrook and Dunn's Corner School? Yes, no. Pass. I have to pass on that one as well. Okay. Lori Wycall, no. Angela Gothals, yes. Leslie Dunn, yes. Timothy Killam, yes. Michael Ober, no. Okay. Uh, number three, to 
Ms. Michael, do you believe that age-appropriate sex education should be taught in Westerly's public schools? Lori Wycall, yes. Angela Gothals, yes. Leslie Dunn, yes. Timothy Killam, yes. Michael Oper, yes. Seth. Seth Logan, yes. Okay. Um, next question to Ms. Gothals. Is civics adequately taught in the Westerly school system? Pass, need more information. Leslie Dunn, pass, need more information. Timothy Killam, yes. Michael Ober, yes. Seth Logan, pass. Lori Wycall, no. Okay. All right, next, uh, Ms. Dunn. Do you believe there is a student drug problem in the Westerly Middle and High Schools? Leslie Dunn, pass. Timothy Killam, pass. Michael Ober, pass. Seth Logan, pass. Lori Wycall, no. Angela Gothals, pass. Okay. Uh, all right, all right Ms. Ms. Dunn, you started, so we start with Ms. Killam, Mr. Killam. Uh, do you are you in favor of parents having the power to have books removed from the school library and or classrooms? Timothy Killam, no. Michael Ober, no. Seth Logan, yes. Lori Wycall, yes. Angela Gothals, no. Leslie Dunn, no. Okay. Um, and now this one goes to, okay, so we started. Then we came this way back to you, I think. Okay. Um, Mr. Ober, do you think that there are too many administrative and specialized staff in the Westerly School? Uh, Michael Ober, no. Seth Logan, pass. Lori Wycall, yes. Angela Gothals, no. Leslie Dunn, no. Timothy Killam, no. Okay. Um, Mr. Logan, first, do you support the town taking $500,000 from the undesignated fund for artificial turf at the high school? Seth Logan, yes. Lori Wycall, no. Angela Gothals, pass. Leslie Dunn, yes. Timothy Killam, yes. Michael Ober, yes. Okay. Um, Ms. Wycall, do you think that bullying in school and or online continues to be a problem in the Westerly schools? Lori Wycall, yes. Angela Gothals, yes. Leslie Dunn, yes. Timothy Killam, yes. Michael Ober, yes. Seth Logan, yes. Okay, the last question, Ms. Gothels. Did you or your children or grandchildren attend Westerly Public Schools? <laughs> Angela Gothels, no. <laughs> Uh, well, my kids attend Westerly Public Schools. <laughs> no grandkids. Leslie Dunn, yes, attended Westerly Public Schools. Timothy Killam, kill my children, yes. Michael Ober, yes, my children. Seth Logan, yes, my children. Lori Wycall, yes. Okay. All right, so now it's time for, the, for your um, ending statement. Um, and we're going to start here with Mr. Gillum. One minute. Um, begin. Uh, first, I want to thank the League uh, for hosting this evening and the Town of Westerly for uh, allowing us to use the chambers. Um, I've been an active, involved parent for many years, and I have many years to go uh, still having a kindergarten student within the district. 
Um, some of my top priorities are safety in our schools, CTE programming to retain students and increase student enrollment um, to make the Westerly the district to attend. With my experience previously serving on the school committee, I understand the complexity of the budget. I'm also a member of the local advisory committee sitting on the leadership board um, regarding special education. I, would, I will dedicate and devote myself to the students, staff, families, everybody in Westerly. I believe in being accessible, collaborative, and transparent to all constituents of Westerly and everybody that comes forward to speak to their elected officials. I look forward to uh, your vote on November 8th for a seat on the Westerly School Committee. Uh, Leslie Dunn, thank you to the League of Women Voters uh, for hosting this and for everybody who's watching and um, being a part of this process as we elect our new town officials. Um, I am a Westerly High School graduate. Uh, I had three brothers who have gone through Westerly High School, well, one who's still in the high school. Um, the town of Westerly is very special to me. My education is very special to me, and I am so grateful for the opportunities that I was afforded um, and how that has shaped uh, my professional career. So I really look forward to having the opportunity to uh, help Westerly schools be the best that they can be, to build up our enrollment, and to really create programming that attracts families to come here and keeps our students within our district. We are in such a crucial time now where we really need to lay good foundations and the groundwork to make sure our students are walking out of the doors of Westerly High School ready for that next step in life. I look forward to having the opportunity to work with community partners, to work with families, to make sure that we're having our students dictate what the experience should look like for Westerly Public Schools. So I hope you will vote for me and for my running mate, Mike Ober. Thank you. Thank you so much to the League of Women Voters. My great-grandmother was a suffragette, so women voters is my heart. I recently heard someone refer to parents as the stewards and shepherds of their children's life experience. And I believe, as daunting as that sounds, that is the task of the school committee in partnership with our amazing teachers and our beautiful community, I think we have an opportunity here to move forward with hope and openness and new ideas and new voices. And I really hope that the conversation that is happening around election time continues. I think we're better for it. And I've been honored that you've listened to what I've had to say throughout this process. So thank you so much, and I really humbly ask for your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you, Lori Wycall. Um, as a school committee member, I will listen to what the parents and the community members have to say in order to uh, elevate the children and, and have better educational outcomes. I've been that parent at the podium at these school committee meetings for years and years, and I know how it feels, so I'll listen and I'll work with people in the community. I'll ad advocate to get our education uh, back to basics and push back on initiatives that are non-academic that are coming down from RIDE. As we know, all of our academics and educational curriculum are coming down from RIDE. Um, that safe and secure schools and a student resource officer is a top priority of mine, and also transparency for the school committee itself. Um, following proper procedures will be in a very important position of mine. Uh, the district needs some effective leadership, and I hope to be part of that in the upcoming election. Please vote for Lori Wycall. Thank you. Hate to get too soft, but uh, on November 8th, your vote is vital to restore stability and tradition to Westerly Public Schools. No, this is not about me as an individual. This is about us, a community with unwavering values, strength, and resolve. Witnessing this town come together and rally behind our children has been one of the most moving experiences of my life. It is my promise to you, my community, to do, a, to do my best to be a voice for the parents and taxpayers, to be a positive role model to our students, to move our district back towards practical, common sense, fundamental education, to uphold and restore parental rights, to increase student privacy, to foster tradition, dignity, integrity, accountability, transparency, and stability, and to always put our children's safety, security, and their mental health and well-being first. Thank you. Uh, Michael Ober. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for this forum. 
I spent the last 20 years involved in our school system and local government. When I was a member of the Wesley School Committee, we were able to work together to reduce per pupil expenditures, exceed expectations of no child left behind, build and renovate our schools, and balance our budget. We were able to achieve these things by working together on a school committee with the town council. We can do this again. That is why I'm asking for your vote November 8th for myself and Leslie Dunn. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you for giving your time and your caring to your town. Good for you. Nice right. hand. Yeah. Before you all jump up, I have a few remarks, please. Uh, I want to thank the candidates and to our moderator, Pat Cole, and to our audience here in Town Hall Chamber. Uh, and the viewers uh, on the town Facebook as well as public access TV. Uh, there are many people who've helped with the production of this forum who also deserve thanks, so I need to mention them. First, the League of Women Voters Rhode Island Education Fund for providing funding for this kind of event as well as programs that we do. Westerly Town Manager, Mr. Sean Lacey, and Mr. Mark Harris, IT Director, as well as his staff for making this forum and the live streaming possible. Many thanks also to the members of League of Women Voters, particularly the Voter Services Committee and other League members who worked many hours on planning this event. But our greatest appreciation in a way goes to the many citizens in Westerly who submitted an incredible number of questions this time, more for the school committee than for the town council, actually, um, more than we've ever received before. And our job has been to vet those questions, put them into as nonpartisan a form as we can. Um, and I do want you to know that most of the questions were based on multiple topics repeated over and over again. There will be a link to this forum posted on the South County League Facebook page, which is League of Women Voters South County. And also, it will be on the state. Uh, website, lwvri.org. There will also, I'm sorry, I don't have it for tonight, but it will be rebroadcast on public access TV. Um, so you can check their rebroadcast schedule. On the back table, there's information about voting. I'd love for you to take a, uh, a look. As you know, there are three different ways to vote this year on November 8th in person, uh, early in town hall, which started yesterday. Uh, and by mail if you already sent in an application to vote by mail. Um, lastly, this is for the audience. You've all hopefully received um, a comment card. We do pay attention and we do modify what we do based on the feedback we get. So please complete one uh, and give it to the League members in the back. And we hope you stay for the next forum. There'll be a break of about, well, actually 20 minutes now um, for District 2838. <laughs> Got it wrong, sorry. Yeah. District 38, uh, Senate District coming next at 715. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>